From New York, this is Democracy Now! Vladimir Putin thinks that Donald Trump is, should be president of the United States, and that's why Russia is helping you get oh, elected Mr. so you lose. Bernie and I agree on a lot of things, but I think I would make a better president. If you think the last four years has been chaotic, imagine spending the better part of 2020 with Bernie Sanders versus Donald Trump. We should pay attention to where the voters of this country are, Bernie. They are not with you. Two out of seven. That's the number of Democratic candidates at last night's debate who were billionaires. With Michael Bloomberg and Tom Steyer at either end of the stage, frontrunner Bernie Sanders was at the center facing a barrage of criticism. Misconception, and you're hearing it here tonight, is that the ideas I'm talking about are radical. They're not. In one form or another, they exist in countries all over the world. We'll speak with Anand Girdadas, author of Winners Take All, the elite charade of changing the world. He also just wrote the front page New York Times Sunday review piece, The Billionaire Election. Does the world belong to them or to us? We'll also then go to Columbia and Charleston, South Carolina for reaction. And we'll look at billionaire Michael Bloomberg facing calls to release his tax records. I got into this race only 10 or 12 weeks ago. We've been working on our tax returns. I've said they'll be out. We probably have another couple of weeks left to go. We're doing it as fast as we can. We've complied with every single requirement for disclosure. And when I was mayor of New York, we had our tax returns out 12 years in a row, and we will do that in the White House. We'll speak with reporter Bob Henley. He covered Bloomberg's three terms as mayor of New York City and says Bloomberg is lying about releasing his taxes. All that and more coming up. Welcome to Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. The U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention is warning Americans to prepare for an outbreak of the coronavirus that's rocked China and hammered the global economy, saying it's not a question of if, but when the virus comes to the United States. The warning came as new coronavirus cases spread far beyond China's Hubei province, the epicenter of the outbreak, where more than 50 million people remain on lockdown. Overnight, more deaths were reported in China, Italy, Japan and in South Korea, where a U.S. soldier has been quarantined after contracting coronavirus. In Iran, where the public health system has been decimated by the U.S.-led sanctions, a lawmaker says 50 people have died of coronavirus in infection in the city of Qom alone. Elsewhere, Algeria has reported its first case, and Brazil has reported its possible first patient. In the U.S., San Francisco Mayor London Breed declared a state of emergency Tuesday, even though there have been no reported cases in the Bay Area. Nancy Messonnier, director of the CDC's Center for Immunization and Respiratory Diseases, warned Americans to prepare for serious disruptions to daily life. Some community-level interventions that may be most effective in reducing the spread of a new virus, like school closures, are also the most likely to be associated with unwanted consequences and further disruptions. Secondary consequences of some of these measures might include missed work and loss of income. I understand this whole situation may seem overwhelming and that disruption to everyday life may be severe. But these are things that people need to start thinking about now. The CDC's stark warning came on the same day White House economic adviser Larry Kudlow dismissed the threat of coronavirus, telling CNBC the virus is contained. His remark echoed President Trump's assessment Tuesday that coronavirus is, quote, very well under control. On Capitol Hill, senators grilled senior administration officials over their response to the crisis. This is Republican Senator John Kennedy of Louisiana, who blasted acting Homeland Security Secretary Chad Wolf for struggling to produce basic facts about the coronavirus. HHS on that. Mr. Secretary, my you're, budget you're, supports, you're, you're supposed to keep a safe. My budget supports the men and women you're of the, the Department Secretary of Homeland Security. You're the Secretary of Homeland Security. Yes, sir. And you can't tell me if we have enough respirators. Meanwhile, U.S. stock markets plunge for the second straight day Tuesday, with the Dow Jones falling by nearly 1,900 points this week on fears the coronavirus will further damage the global economy. 
In Charleston, South Carolina, seven candidates for the Democratic presidential nomination squared off for a raucous debate Tuesday night, focusing a barrage of criticism on frontrunner Bernie Sanders as he seeks to consolidate his lead in Saturday's South Carolina primary. Two of the candidates are billionaires, Michael Bloomberg and Tom Steyer, who were at either end of the stage. They were joined by former Vice President Joe Biden, Senators Elizabeth Warren and Amy Klobuchar, and former South Bend Mayor Pete Buttigieg. Audience members at times booed Sanders and cheered Buttigieg and Bloomberg. South Carolina TV station WCSC reported the Charleston County Democratic Party offered tickets to people who sponsored the debate at a cost of $1,750 to $3,200 per sponsorship, calling it the, quote, only guaranteed way to get a ticket. After headlines, we'll play highlights of the debate and go to South Carolina for reaction. In India, the death toll from religious riots in Delhi has risen to 24, with police accused of turning a blind eye to violence against Muslims committed by Hindu nationalist mobs. On Tuesday, assailants set fire to a mosque while attackers used iron bars, rocks and pickaxes to attack Muslims, protesting against Hindu nationalist Prime Minister Narendra Modi's new citizenship law, which widely restricts Muslim immigration to India. This comes as Modi himself has been accused of sanctioning the massacre of more than 2,000 Muslims in 2002, when he was chief minister of the state of Gujarat. The violence came as President Trump wrapped up his visit to India, where he joined Modi for a massive rally in Gujarat before praising a U.S.-India weapons deal. Earlier today, we expanded our defense cooperation with agreements for India to purchase more than $3 billion of advanced American military equipment, including Apache and MH-60 Romeo helicopters, the finest in the world. The Syrian Observatory for Human Rights said Tuesday a Syrian government offensive on the last major rebel-held province of Idlib left 20 civilians dead, including at least nine children, after Russian-backed Syrian forces targeted schools and hospitals for attack. The deaths were reported as Turkish-backed opposition fighters said they've captured a strategic strategic northwestern town near a junction of two major highways. The violence in Idlib has forced hundreds of thousands and, by some accounts, over a million people to flee to squalid camps near the Turkish border. A spokesperson for the International Committee of the Red Cross Tuesday warned against further attacks on hospitals and schools and demanded safe passage for civilians. The International Committee of the Red Cross is deeply alarmed by the rapidly deteriorating security and living conditions of the hundreds of thousands of newly displaced civilians in the Idlib area, who are running out of options to find basic safety for themselves and their families. This is the worst wave of displacement we've seen during the Syrian conflict. Now, with the harsh winter conditions in Idlib, we see people trapped, isolated, and running out of ways to cope. The U.S. military has vastly underreported the number of civilians killed in U.S.-supported airstrikes in Somalia, with the number of civilian deaths as much as 69 times greater than acknowledged by U.S. Africa Command. That's according to data released Tuesday by the watchdog monitoring group Air Wars, which found between 71 and 139 civilians have been killed in U.S.-backed strikes in Somalia since 2007. That figure far exceeds AFRICOM's official count of just two civilian deaths. Back in the U.S., the Supreme Court ruled in a sharply divided five to four decision Tuesday, the family of a 15-year-old Mexican teen killed by a U.S. Border Patrol agent a decade ago cannot sue the officer in federal court without the approval of the U.S. Congress. In 2010, the teenager, Sergio Adrian Hernandez Guerica, was shot across the El Paso Juarez border by U.S. Border Patrol agent Jesus Mesa, Jr. The teen was in Mexico. It's the latest example of impunity for U.S. Border Patrol officers who commit homicide across the Mexican border. In 2018, a federal jury in Tucson, Arizona, found Border Patrol agent Lonnie Swartz not guilty of manslaughter for shooting and killing 16-year-old Jose Rodriguez through the U.S.-Mexico border fence in 2012. To see our coverage with his family in Mexico, go to democracynow.org. A British pharmaceutical company has reached a tentative deal to settle hundreds of U.S. lawsuits over its role in fueling the opioid crisis. The generic drug manufacturer, Malincrot, says the 1.6 
$1.6 billion deal has the support of attorneys general from 47 U.S. states and territories. Federal data show the company was a top provider of highly addictive prescription pain medication at the peak of the opioid crisis, shipping some 2.3 billion pills over an eight-year period beginning in 2006. In Los Angeles, a group of women who have accused Harvey Weinstein of sexual misconduct said Tuesday they're encouraged by the Hollywood movie mogul's conviction on charges of rape and sexual assault in a Manhattan court. New York authorities have said they're prepared to release Weinstein into the custody of their counterparts in Los Angeles, where he faces charges. He raped one woman and sexually assaulted another on back-to-back -back nights in 2013 during Oscars week. The charges could bring Weinstein an additional 28 years in prison. This is Sarah Ann Mass, one of the more than 90 women who have accused Harvey Weinstein of sex crimes. As we turn our efforts and attention to the looming criminal trial in Los Angeles, I have a message for Harvey, for all abusers, rape myth perpetuators, victim blamers, and those who have retaliated against us. This one's for you. Your time is up. The time for survivors to rise up and thrive has come. Opera superstar Placido Domingo has apologized to more than two dozen women who've accused him of sexual misconduct in the workplace spanning decades, writing, quote, I respect that these women finally felt comfortable enough to speak out, and I want them to know that I am truly sorry for the hurt that I caused them, unquote. On Tuesday, soprano singer Luz del Albo Rubio stepped forward with her own story of abuse, saying Placido Domingo had her blackballed from working at the Washington National Opera and from other roles after she refused his repeated and unwelcome sexual advances. Rubio told reporters, quote, before he was a denier, then he was a victim. Now he's looking for redemption. If he means it, if he's really sorry, I would ask him to apologize to us face to face. There have been women suffering for 20 years. He should ask for our forgiveness, she said. And Police in Orlando, Florida, have released video of an officer handcuffing and arresting a six-year-old African-American girl as she cries and begs to be let go. After the incident in September 2019 drew national outrage, one of the arresting officers, Dennis Turner, was fired. The newly released video shows a second officer who has not been identified, but whose name appears as Ramos in the body cam video, binding the hands of six-year-old Kaya Roll in plastic restraints before leading her out of her elementary school and placing her in a squad car. Kaya was then fingerprinted, photographed for a mugshot, and sent to a juvenile detention center. Criminal charges against the six-year-old girl were dropped the next day. Kaya's grandmother is pushing for a Florida bill that would prohibit police from arresting anyone under age 12, except in extreme circumstances. And those are some of the headlines. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. Two out of seven. That's the number of Democratic candidates in last night's debate who are billionaires. Michael Bloomberg and Tom Steyer were at either end of the debate stage in Charleston, South Carolina, with frontrunner Bernie Sanders front and center, facing a barrage of criticism from his challengers. He was flanked by former Vice President Joe Biden and Senator Elizabeth Warren, Senator Amy Klobuchar, and former South Bend Mayor Pete Buttigieg, who all tried to appeal to African American and moderate voters in a battleground state. This is moderator Nora O'Donnell questioning Bernie Sanders. Sanders during the debate, which was sponsored by CBS and the Congressional Black Caucus Institute. Senator Sanders, we haven't had a national unemployment rate this low for this long in 50 years. Here in South Carolina, the unemployment rate is even lower. How will you convince voters that a Democratic socialist can do better than President Trump with the economy? Well, you're right. The economy is doing really great for people like Mr. Bloomberg and other billionaires. In the last three years, last three years, billionaires in this country saw an $850 billion increase in their wealth. But you know what? For the ordinary American, things are not so good. Last year, real wage increases for the average worker were less than 1%. Half of our people are living paycheck to paycheck. 87 million Americans have 
no health insurance or are underinsured. 45 million people are struggling with student debt. 500,000 people tonight are sleeping out on the street, including 30,000 veterans. That is not an economy that's working for the American people. That's an economy working for the 1%. I think that uh, Donald Trump thinks it would be better if he's president. I do not think so. Vladimir Putin thinks that Donald Trump is, should be president of the United States. And that's why Russia is helping you get oh, elected so Mr. you'll Bloomberg. lose to him. I Let me tell Mr. Putin... Okay, I'm not a good friend of President Xi of China. I think President Xi is an authoritarian leader. And let me tell Mr. Putin, who interfered in the 2016 election, try to bring Americans against Americans. Hey, Mr. Putin, if I'm president of the United States, trust me, you're not going to interfere in any more American elections. So this was the final debate before Saturday's primary in South Carolina and Super Tuesday when 14 states will vote. South Carolina TV station WCSC um, reported the Charleston County Democratic Party offered tickets to people who sponsored the debate at a cost of $1,750 to $3,200 per sponsorship, calling it the, quote, only guaranteed way to get a ticket to last night's debate. In a few minutes, we'll go to South Carolina to get reaction there. But first, we're joined here in New York by Anand Girdadas, editor-at-large of Time magazine. His book is called Winners Take All, The Elite Charade of Changing the World. On Sunday, he had a cover story of The New York Times Week in Review titled The Billionaire Election, Does the World Belong to Them? or to us. Welcome back to Democracy Now! Thank Anand. you for having me. Um, so that's pretty astounding. Two of the seven Democratic candidates who are considered so often the Republican, um, the uh, People's Party, are billionaires. What does this say to you, who are Running on the stage last night? Running to replace a self-described billionaire who actually probably isn't one. Um, you know, let's just stick with the physical scene that you just showed those shots of. So, because I think it's a metaphor for what I what I have called the billionaire election or the billionaire referendum that that 2020 is. So you got these seven people on stage. On two ends are actual billionaires. The two candidates in the middle, uh, Elizabeth Warren and Bernie Sanders, are candidates who have risen to prominence precisely on the platform of running against billionaires and the idea that billionaire power is excessive and is suffocating the American dream for people. Um, then you have the $1,700 to $3,200 tickets, which captures the way in which the Democratic Party is an ostrich, not understanding that we live in an age in which people are actually rising up against plutocracy. And this is the kind of, you know, uh, foot fault that you don't want to make. Um, and then you have, you know, CBS is a big corporation hosting the debate. Twitter is collaborating. That's owned by a billionaire. Billionaires are the, the, the stewards, the captains of an economy that has generated so much of the rage this year that is being, uh, that is presenting itself in the election. And so this is an election in which you have to have a stand. You have to know where you stand on the question of billionaires in order to vote in this primary and in this general election. If you don't have a perspective on billionaires, you can't, you can't actually make this choice meaningfully because for very long in this country, the story that we have told about billionaires is they are like helium balloons. They're just people who happen to have drifted up from among the rest of us. That's been the story. And yes, they had more and maybe the gap was a little too high, but they were just people who drifted up. And maybe if we could get more people, a little helium and drift them up, then we'd be better off. A new story is emerging, a truer story, which is that a lot of those folks and certainly that class of people is up there because they are standing on other people's backs and they stand on people's backs by using and abusing tax havens like Bermuda. Hello, Bloomberg. Um, they stand on people's backs by profiting from uh, an economy like the financial sector that has destroyed the American dream for so many people. Hello, Michael Bloomberg. Um, they stand on people's backs by lobbying for bottle service public policy that is of private benefit to them, but, of, but detrimental to the public. And I think Americans are actually waking up to the fact that we have been living in this, what I call this winners take all America, in which the country is not being run 
for Americans. It is being run for money. I, I actually have gotten tired of the language of inequality, even though I wrote an entire book about it, multiple books about it, because I think people don't, it doesn't click with people what we're actually talking about. So if you are someone listening to this who's not, I mean, you're probably not because you're watching Democracy Now!, but someone who's not so excited about the inequality issue, think about it this way. In every year in this country and in all countries, a certain amount of future reigns on all of us. A certain amount of progress reigns on all of us. A certain amount of innovation reigns on all of us, right? Innovation is the Latin word for new stuff. And the question then becomes, when that new stuff, the future, progress reigns on us, who gets it? Who harvests the rainwater? And what has actually happened is the future has become a thing that is privately gated and enjoyed and monopolized by very few people, which means that you can be living in an age where extraordinary things are being invented. The Internet is being invented. Medical advances are happening. But if you are not in the gated community that enjoys the fruits of the future, you are stuck in 1979. And that's true as a matter of wages for many people. It's true as a matter of health access for many people. Uh, it's true as a matter of information access for many people who are listening to media that is distorting their minds. And I think what's at stake in 2020 is we wake up to the idea that either we are going to uh, resign ourselves to living in a country that billionaires rule, or we're going to actually muster the gumption to remind billionaires that they are living in our country. I want to go not to last night's debate, but the Las Vegas debate, the uh, the time when Mike Bloomberg, you might have called him the pinata in Nevada. Um, and this is the exchange between Senator Sanders and uh, former New York City Mayor Mike Bloomberg. Um, this was moderated by MSNBC. What we need to do to deal with this grotesque level of income and wealth inequality is make sure that those people who are working, you know what, Mr. Bloomberg, wasn't you who made all that money. Maybe your workers played some role in that as well. And it is important that those workers are able to share the benefits. Also, when we have so many people who go to work every day and they feel not good about their jobs. They feel like cogs in a machine. I want workers to be able to sit on corporate boards as well so they can have some say over what happens to their lives. Mayor Bloomberg, you own a large company. Would you support what Senator Sanders is proposing? Absolutely not. I can't think of a ways that would make it easier for Donald Trump to get reelected than listening to this conversation. <laughs> it's ridiculous. We're not going to throw out capitalism. We tried that. Other countries tried that. It was called communism, and it just didn't work. If you can respond to that, Anand Gerdadas, um, uh, and also uh, talk about when when Mike Bloomberg said, I worked hard for that money. I mean, first of all, just, uh, you know, it's so interesting, given that this is, you know, it's an election. It's a contest about actually connecting with people. Uh, it's so interesting to me that being that rich, as Michael Bloomberg is, makes there be no one in your life who actually tells you how you come across to people. I mean, his, he has the charisma of, like, a large piece of cheese that ate a robot. You know, it, it, it's hard to even make up how unable he is to connect to people. But he's probably just surrounded by people who are like, oh, my God, sir, you are connecting, which is part of the problem of being a billionaire. Um, that exchange was so telling. And what happens in Vegas absolutely must not stay in Vegas, because... What he is arguing is the 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 mon he's not just a guy who happens to be rich running in a progressive primary. He is running as a rich guy with all the rich guy intuitions, which is I'm worth sixty billion dollars because I earned that and nobody else had any part in that. And that is an ideology that just frankly does not belong in the Democratic Party. And it's just it's 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 a kind of twentieth century it's just it's old, to be honest. It's just old. There's like I mean I know through my reporting, a number of billionaires who just absolutely don't think that anymore, right? That's not even cutting-edge thinking within the circle of billionaires, right? I've had billionaires text me being like, what's this guy doing, right? Like, this guy... Like, let's be just clear for a second. Michael Bloomberg is making billionaires uncomfortable with his defense of billionaires. This is a true fact that I can attest from my iMessages. So I think we got to think about this notion that he's articulating. It's a notion in which his wealth is somehow independent of all the extraordinary things in society that we've all paid into, from public schools to public roads to the, you know, financial regulators who allow him to build that kind of business. Um, you know, Michael Bloomberg—look, anybody watching this 
should feel grateful to America. But Michael Bloomberg should feel 60 billion times more grateful than anybody watching this. I right? Want... You, like, all of your lives watching this are sort of dependent, pretty dependent, on America being a functioning society with nice common things. But his life is really, really dependent on those common things. Because more than anybody watching this, he really depends on Wall Street regulators doing their job. He really depends on the United States court system doing its job well. Nothing he does is possible without that. He really depends, when you're hiring that many people, on there being a widely educated, well-educated workforce. And so it feels particularly churlish when you have an obligation to be 60 billion times more grateful than the average person for public systems to denigrate them and claim that everything you made is your private prerogative that you could have done in any context in the world, without any of these shared systems. I want to go back to Michael Bloomberg, but this is last night uh, in South Carolina, talking about the influence his money had on the 2018 midterm election. The, all of the new Democrats that came in and put Nancy Pelosi in charge and gave the Congress the ability to control this president, I, bought, I, I got them. So, you're the author of Winners Take All, the elite charade of changing the world. He said, look how I used my money. You know, it's so interesting. I was thinking about this. I wish I was prescient enough to write this book because I knew Michael Bloomberg was going to run for president. I didn't. But I wrote it precisely out of a curiosity of people like him, right? And so, a few years ago, the phenomenon I noticed about America that led to the book was... The Bloombergs of the world have two sides to them. If you look at Michael Bloomberg's philanthropic activities, which, which rhyme with the activities of many, many people like him, we can't deny that. A lot of money being given away, maybe more than in history. Not a, lot, not a big percentage for a lot of people, but more money is flowing. 400-some billion dollars are given away in America every year. A lot of money. And I looked at people like him giving money away, doing these things, changing the world, giving back, making a difference. Africa, Africa, Africa. They love Africa. All this talk about these activities. But then, inconveniently, I looked at a second thing, which is also true about people like Michael Bloomberg, which is that if you looked at the actual economic data, they were monopolizing, as I said earlier, the fruits of the future. They were monopolizing progress. So, on the one hand, they were doing all these nice things, which Michael Bloomberg absolutely does. And on the other hand, they were actually increasing, not decreasing, their share of the pie every year. So it started to make me wonder, what's the relationship between all these nice activities and the bad activities, the hoarding, the, 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 the generosity and the injustice? And the conclusion I came to in the book is that the kind of giving that folks like Michael Bloomberg do is the wingman of their taking. The kind of generosity they engage in is the wingman of the injustice they uphold. And the making a difference that they talk about is the wingman of their making a killing. And you see in Bloomberg how. Because he is using his wealth to attempt to purchase the presidency. That's certainly a way in which, you know, spend, ha having that money is a, and, and, and using the reputation glow of philanthropy can help you. Second, a lot of people who have endorsed him are people who have benefited from his charitable largesse. Right? So you use this making a difference to actually increase, not decrease your power. This, in, in an age of plutocracy, which we are in, the central issue in this country is whether you're going to find a way to break the stranglehold on wealth and power of a few people at the top. And if you do not have a plan to do that, you by default have a plan to perpetuate that. Would you say that the billionaire's election, talking about it that way, is sort of a coded way, a coded critique of capitalism? And now, when you have Michael Bloomberg coming into the race, he won't be in South Carolina so much as the as Super Tuesday, um, his pouring millions into taking on Bernie Sanders and trying to make this an issue about uh, socialism, uh, red-baiting him as much as possible, uh, trying to pose it as, you either have me or you have Cuba. This is such an American talking point that Michael Bloomberg is engaged in that we all need to educate. First of all, you know, I think, look, I think there are some people who had a great life in the 20th century who should have considered remaining in it, right? Like, if your framework, like, if you are still running nuclear drills in your mind, right, you may not belong in the 21st century. Like, a lot of—and I see it on TV— all the time. Like, there are people who clearly have Cold War trauma, and I feel for them, 
But we're not actually in the Cold War anymore, right? We're, we're in just a completely different era, right? And, and it, just as it would have been unhelpful in the Cold War to be, like, talking about what we need to do in the trenches of World War I, it's just not a helpful framework for the Cold War, because it's just not now. It's not particularly helpful now, in 2020, to be reliving your own Cold War trauma as guidance for the United States. Michael Bloomberg is trying to prevent, uh, present this you know, old American talking point that you got two choices, people. We can either be a Goldman Sachs country or we can be Maduro's Venezuela. Those are your choices. Those are your, that's the whole choice. We have come to a place in America, which I find fascinating, where our understanding of gender is more fluid than our understanding of capitalism, socialism, and democracy. It's remarkable. I never would have expected that. We've made tremendous progress in understanding that it's not like men, women, nothing in between. It's complicated. People fall all kinds of places on that distribution. But capitalism and socialism, no, no, no. It's one or the other. The reality is, for any person who's actually traveled or read a book, every country in the world, with maybe a couple of exceptions, has some mix, capitalism and socialism. When you're on the highway, the thing beneath you, socialism. The things on the highway, capitalism. The cars and the trucks carrying stuff. When you are on Wall Street, the banks, capitalism. The regulators that make sure that brokers are not stealing their money, socialism. Right? When you ha work for 40 years at IBM, capitalism. When you retire and have Social Security and Medicare take care of you, socialism. Right? It's, only, it's early in the morning. I have already in the course of this day, by eating certain things... Engaged in capitalism. By taking a car here, engaged in capitalism. But I've also benefited profoundly just by 8 a.m. from socialism, from the fact that people, uh, you know, there were roads. It was nice to have roads on the way here, made a much, much faster commute. Uh, you know, all the ways in which capitalism and socialism are actually part of every hour of our lives. Let's end this ridiculous binary and have some understanding of economic fluidity. Anand Girdadas, thank you so much for being with us. Time magazine editor-at-large. His new book, Winners Take All, The Elite Charade of Changing the World. And we'll link to his New York Times cover story of the week in review uh, called The Billionaire Election. Does the world belong to them or to us? When we come back, we go to Charleston and Columbia, South Carolina. Stay with us. Shovels and Rope. This is Democracy Now! I'm Amy Goodman. Tuesday night's Democratic presidential debate comes just four days before South Carolina's first in the South primary, one week before more than a dozen states vote on Super Tuesday. Billionaire Tom Steyer has poured money into outreach to African-American voters who make up more than half of South Carolina's Democratic electorate. A new Reuters poll shows Senator Sanders has overtaken former Vice President Joe Biden in support among African-Americans. For more, we go to South Carolina, where we're joined by three guests. In Charleston, where the debate took place, we're joined by Democratic State Representative Gilda Cobb-Hunter, president of the National Black Caucus of State Legislators, also a senior national advisor for Democratic presidential candidate Tom Steyer. Adolph Reed, Jr. is also with us. He is professor emeritus of political science at University of Pennsylvania, columnist with The New Republic, and an organizer for I'm a Medicare Voter campaign in South Carolina. In Columbia, we're joined by Kevin Alexander Gray, longtime rights activist, community organizer, author of Waiting for Lightning to Strike, the Fundamentals of Black Politics. He was Jesse Jackson's South Carolina campaign manager in 1988, past president of the ACLU of South Carolina. We welcome you all to Democracy Now! Kevin Alexander Gray, let's go to you first in South Carolina's capital, in Columbia. Um, respond to last night's debate. First of all, I'd like to say hello to my two friends, Dr. Reed and Gilda Cobb Hunter, two hey, people that Kevin. I respect widely. Hi, Kevin. How you doing, brother? And of good course, to hear you. And I'm, good, I'm good, brother. And Adolph and I uh, work with uh, the Harkin campaign together. 
And uh, Adolph was actually on my dissertation committee, so I have something in common with everybody <laughs> on your show today. But now, but now watch, watching the, uh, the debate last night, well, it wasn't uh, the Confederates firing on Fort Sumter, but it was fiery. <laughs> and uh, I think that Senator Sanders uh, showed himself well. Um, I think that um, looking at the race in South Carolina, is going to line up with, I think, Senator Sanders doing well. I think Tom Stiers is going to do well because he has done outreach in the black community and has campaigned uh, the old-fashioned way. And the way I see the vote breaking down, uh, older voters are going to—older Democratic Party establishment voters are going to vote with Biden. Um, uh, younger voters are going to vote with Sanders because, it, the, the, because of the institutional change and structural change that he represents, given uh, college education cost and given the cost of health care. And I think that the folk that support Stiers are the people who— um, Stiers has put money in the black community. He's invested in the black banks. Uh, he's hired black consultants. He's done something that hasn't been done in a while in campaigns in South Carolina, where usually the money goes to, um, goes to white consultants and advertising companies, and, and black folk are left out of the loop. So Stiers has benefited by that kind of outreach and a, and a focus on economic development. But last night, I think that uh, Sanders did well. Um, and I think that, that uh, at times, uh, Vice President Biden looked like uh, uh, General Ad uh, Admiral Stockdale with uh, the where, where am I and what am I doing here kind of approach to, to, to campaigning in South Carolina. <clears throat> Um, I want to go to Democratic State Representative Gilda Cobb Hunter. I last saw you in Orangeburg, South Carolina, at the Environmental hey, Justice. Amy. Hi. Um, uh, yes. uh, How are you? Pre candidates Forum at, um, at South Carolina State. Um, you now are supporting Tom Steyer. Why? Amy, I have agreed to uh, be, serve as a national senior advisor to Tom Steyer, mainly for the point. Uh, one of the reasons is the point that Kevin just made, having been engaged in, pol in politics, presidential politics here for the last 20 years, Tom Steyer is the only Democratic candidate I know who has made the time and invested in the black community in the manner that Kevin outlined. In addition to that, you mentioned the Environmental Justice Forum in November. Tom Steyer has specific plans tied to environmental justice, because we've got to go in and not just clean up communities, but we've got to have a plan to incentivize economic development, and all of those for those marginalized and underserved communities. The other part for me is his plan for HBCUs, historically black colleges and universities. Steyer has committed, if elected president, to invest $150 billion, billion with a B, not million, in HBCUs. He's not just talked about investing the money. He has a definite plan to spread this out over 10 years to create an infrastructure for HBCUs that will address one of the priority needs, which is infrastructure meaning buildings that have just deteriorated because state governments across the South in particular have not funded HBCUs like they should. The other piece of that, uh, of his HBCU plan that attracts me, is the sustainability part of it. He is calling for a creation of an HBCU Board of Regents, which will help coordinate all of the federal funding that HBCUs receive. Right now, it's a hodgepodge. All of the universities, unless they have a lobbyist or a member of Congress who is going to help them navigate the process, that is not in place. The endowment leads to the point of sustainability, because what we I'm a proud graduate of the Florida A&M University, and one of the things that all of our HBCUs have to do is build endowments. A part of the Steyer plan will allow that. And, of course, reparations, which is, I, as far as I'm aware of, Tom Steyer is the only one on the campaign trail who has called for reparations. And tied into reparations is the whole conversation about race. He has consistently, in every audience, talked about race, 
the connections that race have with all of the systemic problems we have. And quite frankly, I believe, when I, I'm looking at supporting a candidate, that it is important that you not just talk the talk, but you walk the walk. Tom and his wife, Kat, through her work with creating the Beneficial State Bank in Oakland, have proven that they are committed to communities of color, and they've shown that through their work. I wanted to go now to Senator Amy Klobuchar, who I think echoed the views of some of the candidates, um, speaking last night about Medicare for all. No, the math does not add up. In fact, just on 60 Minutes uh, this weekend, he said he wasn't going to rattle through the nickels and the dimes. Well, let me tell you how many nickels and dimes we're talking about. Nearly $60 trillion. Do you know how much that is for all of his programs? Not that true. is three times the American economy, not the federal government, the entire American economy. Uh, the Medicare for All plan alone, uh, page 8, clearly says that it will kick 149 million Americans off their current health insurance. Professor Adolf Reed, you're an organizer for a Medicare—I am a Medicare voter a campaign in South Carolina. Can you respond to what she said? Uh, yeah, well, it's actually—and and, and I'm a Medicare for all voter in South Carolina. <clears throat> Pardon me. Um, yeah, uh, uh, I mean, that—, that that claim is one of one of the most frustratingly uh, you know, disingenuous comments that comes out of uh, that uh, that's come out of the debates that's that, that's come out of uh, the corporate media uh, because the fact of the matter is is um, your Medicare for all will 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 not take coverage away from anyone. Uh, what what a Medicare for all does is takes the the, the, the profit making. Middleman, the insurance companies, uh, out out of the healthcare um, system, and, and and one of the things things that we found as we've gone around in um, you know, South Carolina and elsewhere, talking to working people of all sorts, is that people do understand, right, that um, that, that that nobody loves their insurance company, right? If everybody's main experience of of, of insurance companies in in access to health care is denial, right? Or <clears throat> pardon me, I'm getting over a bad cold. But but the denial comes in many forms. Um, rationing, right? Uh, access to health care on, on the basis of ability to pay is a form of denial. Premiums, co-pays, um, you know, deductibles. Um, um, the constraint in networks, right? People who experience um, you know, the healthcare industry on on the ground understand these things, and they understand it much more clearly if if <coughs> if the insurance industry is not 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 putting money in their political campaigns. <coughs> Let me so, ask uh, uh, the basic principle. No, sure. Go mm -hmm. ahead, Adolf Reed. Oh yeah, well, I was just going to say, like the basic principle of 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 uh, Medicare for all is that everyone has has access to health care. Period. Boom. Right. Uh, you know, without regard to to ability to pay, and and without regard to age, or or where or if or or um, if you work. Right. I mean, it's a very simple proposition that uh, that that the private profit making is. Is taken out of the healthcare industry. And as you go around South Carolina, how much of that is understood? You have Bernie Sanders last night saying a misconception is that the ideas I'm talking about are radical. They're not, he said. In one way or another, they exist in countries all over the world. Well, yeah, I mean that's that's absolutely the case. But I mean, we can say that as we've been working like in South Carolina for the last few few months, we've had a phenomenal response. And I would suggest that people go go to our website djdinstitute.org, and 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 link link to the I'm a Medicare for All Voters South Carolina campaign. I mean, we've we've had more than ten thousand South South Carolinians sign pledges since since December. Uh, I'm indicating that that they won't that, uh, that they'll vote only for candidates who support Medicare for All. And I think that's kind of saying something. That's black white uh, across the board.
Uh, let me go back to uh, Kevin Alexander Gray. Um, you were a critic of Bernie Sanders in 2016, but you've changed your view. You have 10 seconds. Well, I haven't decided who I'm going to vote for, but if you look at the candidates who fall into the progressive uh, progressive camp or the progressive tradition, the tradition of the 88 campaign and a broad coalition of people, uh, 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 opposition to the death penalty, uh, support for free public education, uh, uh, rights for Palestinian people, support for, um, for freedom movements around the world. And then we look at the health care issue, we look at economic development in the community in a structural way, then Bernie Sanders is obviously in that tradition. Um, and so, you know, what we, we have to talk about what the word progressive means and, and what being a progressive means, and not let people who are using the word progressive as a substitute for liberal, because liberal has become a dirty word. So, yeah, I've softened on Sanders, but the other part of it is that Sanders did like Jesse Jackson did between 84 and 88. He's been organizing around the country. And a lot of the criticisms that I had in the beginning was, uh, you know, you start out a campaign, you start out with that coalition, you start out around that table with uh, black people and people of color and women, and, that, and you build from there. You just don't start out with a group of white folk around the table. I think that Senator Sanders has learned that lesson well. And if you look at his campaign. That's not an endorsement, but that's to say that's how he has conducted his campaign, and his campaign is connected to a historic progressive movement, which is what frightens people. And, and going back on what uh, Dr. Reed said about Medicare, I've been spending a lot of time with friends in nursing homes. Uh, lately, I've been doing a lot of eulogies for friends and, and looking at the people in those nursing homes who care for people. A lot of the people who are working in those nursing homes, people don't care for them. They don't care for them by not paying them a good wage, not, by not having neighborhoods that they can live in that are safe. Uh, but there, a lot of them have to go care for people. you got people who are caring for people who people don't care about. And, and, sometimes, and even, even the idea that you have to sign over anything that you would, have, would want to leave to your children to the government before you can get in a nursing home and get a Medicare bed. Those issues are important to people. Uh, health care, the affordability of health care, a livable wage, um, safe communities, uh, ending gentrification and being pushed out of the cities. Those are the uh, issues that progressives are taking on. Um, and to some extent, uh, you know, I'm, and I'm not, because Gilda is a very good friend of mine, and I, I respect her a lot. Uh, Get what Gilda's is right. Styers is, in some respects, with his money, is paying attention to those communities. Now, it's not the structural institutional money that the government and our, ought to be providing to people, but but it's it is an outreach to people that they haven't seen in a while. In an era where black folk and poor people are being pushed out of the cities, being pushed out of their homes, or if. They, they live in poverty, the only uh, in a community mired in poverty, the only thing that the government got for them are more, more and more police. So, you know, yes, I've softened on Sanders. I'm a progressive. Um, I think that he'll do well in South Carolina. Um, this idea that, that we have to uh, nominate somebody that's electable, like a Joe Biden. Well, I keep telling everybody, well, everybody thought that Hubert Humphrey was electable. Everybody thought that Walter Mondale was electable. Everybody thought that Mike Dukakis was electable. They thought that Al Gore was electable. They thought that John Kerry was electable. They thought that Hillary Clinton was electable because they're moderates. And now, for anybody to want to pin their hopes on Joe Biden, who, when you look at his race record, is horrible, and the only race record he got is being uh, Barack Obama's vice president and so-called vouching for him, um, I think if, if the Democrats uh, nominate Joe Biden, they're going to go down in defeat. Well, I want to thank you all for being with us. Kevin Alexander Gray, activist, community organizer, past president of the ACLU of South Carolina, Jesse Jackson, South Carolina campaign manager in 88, speaking to us from South Carolina's capital, Columbia. Adolph Reed, professor emeritus of political science at University of Pennsylvania, columnist with the New Republic, organizer with the I'm a Medicare for All voter campaign in South Carolina, and Democratic state Congress. Uh, 
Representative Gilda Cobb Hunter of Orangeburg, South Carolina, president of the National Black Caucus of State Legislators. She is a senior national advisor for presidential candidate Tom Steyer. We want to thank you all for being with us. Just a little fact here. Something like six to 8,000 um, black voters in Nevada, of course, Iowa and New Hampshire, overwhelmingly white states. In South Carolina, there are more than a quarter of a million African-American voters. Sixty percent of the Democratic Party is African-American. When we come back, we'll speak with reporter Bob Henley, who covered Bloomberg's three terms as mayor in New York City. Stay with us. Behind the Bridge by Carolina Chocolate Drops. This is Democracy Now! I'm Amy Goodman. Our next guest says billionaire Michael Bloomberg lied during last night's Democratic presidential debate in South Carolina when he claimed he released his taxes while he was mayor of New York City. I got into this race only 10 or 12 weeks ago. We've been working on our tax returns. I've said they'll be out. We probably have another couple of weeks left to go. We're doing it as fast as we can. We've complied with every single requirement for disclosure. And when I was mayor of New York, we had our tax returns out 12 years in a row, no. and we will do that in the White House. That was Michael Bloomberg speaking last night in Charleston. He made the same claim during last week's Democratic debate in Las Vegas, saying he had put out his tax return every year for 12 years in City Hall. Well, our next guest says he has the proverbial receipts to prove this is not true. Bob Henley is an award-winning reporter for The Chief Leader. He covered billionaire Michael Bloomberg during his time as mayor all three terms at that time. Bob Henley was a reporter for WNYC, New York's main public radio station. In 2012, he had this exchange with Bloomberg after a press conference. Why won't you disclose what you actually physically pay in terms of federal taxes? Um, there's no reason to. We have categories, and I have a personal life. Uh, the accountants will tell you I pay 100 percent of my taxes. I don't have tax shelters in the context that you would talk about it. Okay. I pay what I'm supposed to pay, and, uh, you know, it's uh, uh, we earn money all around the world. For more, we're joined here in New York by reporter Bob Henley. Well, you heard in that clip. Um, what's wrong here? Well, it's absolutely not true. And uh, one of the things that, as a beat reporter, WNYC uh, had been municipally owned, but uh, we were, uh, became a nonprofit. And we, every year, there was a, a farcical um, disclosure event would occur on Third Avenue at Geller & Co., the accountant, and we would go into a hermetically sealed room, and then Stu Lozier would stand over us, and we couldn't actually make copies, and we were handed the tablet, which was like the equivalent of a Midwestern phone book for a small city, and on each entry was uh, not numbers that you assume with your tax form or my tax form, but letters in the alphabet, A through G, and G would symbolize more than $500,000, and everything was a G. Now, why Democracy Now! is so essential is that this is the only place I can think of to come to actually play this tape, because what's really scary, Amy, we know each other a long time. Other reporters were with me in the room. This ritual was something we all groused about, New York Times, Wall Street Journal, Post, Daily News, and we all said there's no disclosure here. In fact, during the period of time that he was mayor, I started focusing on the fact that he came in at $5 billion, and he wasn't supposed to be active in Bloomberg LP, and strangely, automatically, it was over $20 billion by the time he left. And so I thought, particularly in the circumstance of Occupy Wall Street, we needed to focus on how his wealth was structured. And what I noticed is that when he came in, there were like 40 offshore things, you know, Bloomberg, Cayman Island, LLC, those kinds of things, not necessarily 
uh, something where he was uh, tax evasion, but just structuring of great wealth. So I took these conflict of interest forms to Jeffrey Sachs, respected professor, and he said, Bob, this is a structure of great global wealth that is now beyond the ability of nation states to hold accountable. And that was my aha moment to understand that human beings have a real problem with borders, right? It can, you can be put in a cage, you can be killed trying to cross one. But if wealth travels without a passport, without having making any apology, and the nations of the world now are begging and vying to draw that wealth and will do anything just to have it parked for a while in their country. That's part of this great building of wealth inequality and wealth concentration. Hmm. So what did Mayor Bloomberg say when you pressed him on his offshore investments? He was like, I have businesses all over the world. Like, it was such a non-starter. It was basically, you know, his attitude was, this isn't tax avoidance. This isn't transfer pricing, which is a gimmick that's used. I do business around the world, and it's required that you have licenses in those places to do business. But without the numbers, without the receipts, without the tax return, it's impossible to know. And this was happening, by the way, when he he was saying that we needed to repeal the Bush tax cuts, and then everyone should pay more in taxes across the board in a sense of shared national sacrifice. So it seemed fair to ask him, well, what are you paying? And he refused to do it. He also said, and particularly his, uh, his uh, aides would say, we can't release this because this would have a negative business consequence. And this will echo to people this thing we've lived through with Donald Trump, where is it a private business? Is it a presidency? Because he put uh, the business of preserving his confidentiality and the value of his assets for a competitive advantage over the important transcendent value of civic disclosure. And civic disclosure is really just about humbling yourself because you want to be a public servant. So, Bob Henley, talk about how Michael Bloomberg made his billions. He, he didn't inherit this one. No, and that's the, the most endearing part of the story is, you know, he's a self-made individual, parked cars to get through college, uh, uh, came to New York City, got a great job with Salman Brothers, um, a Wall Street firm, got laid off after several years there, got a $10 million parachute, which is nice. And out of that, he created the Bloomberg LP. And what is that, really? There's these really smart machines, terminals, that you have to have for real-time pricing for assets. So if you want to move a bunch of foreclosed homes or mortgage-backed securities or whatever you want to move through the Cayman Islands, you got to have one of these terminals. So these are all over the world, and it provides real-time information for all these transactions. So, indeed, the financialization of the planet, the proliferation of debt, all the things we've seen that are the engines of the concentration of wealth, the global wealth machine, were facilitated by Bloomberg terminals. Before we go, I wanted to ask you about stop and frisk. The operative word, five million, that's the number of stop and frisks, it's estimated, during the Bloomberg three right. terms. Right, and it's not five individuals. Five million, right. 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 No, right. it's not. It's the number, because many individuals right. stop many exactly. times. They exactly. grew up being stopped. But we only have a minute, and I wanted to ask you about this. Untold suffering of people, and they weren't quiet. I mean, right. thousands and thousands of people marched in the streets right to uh, we Mayor there. Bloomberg's mansion. We were covering it. But what about the financial cost to the city? Right. Well, one of the things that happened was the tort claims. And that's something where something happens to you that you're, you're assaulted. The police have a, some kind of incident of misconduct. The city of New York taxpayers paid a billion dollars over those 12 years to satisfy bad police behavior claims. You mean lawsuits because lawsuits, people were absolutely. stopped and, and I have to also say, in terms of cost, we have 10 seconds. these were ruined lives, too. These were lost scholarships, lost relationships, lives totally destroyed by this process. And $1 billion in settlements that That's the city right. paid Not out? spent on the people, but on these claims. Bob Henley, I want to thank you for being with us. We're going to do part two, and we'll post it at democracynow.org. Bob Henley is the award-winning reporter who's now with the chief leader. Um, tune in Tuesday for our Super Jews Tuesday. Tuesday live broadcast with The Intercept from 7 Eastern time in the evening to midnight. And Democracy Now! has a number of job openings here in our New York City offices from our newsroom producer um, and fellow to our outreach and development teams. Go to democracynow.org for information. Uh, I'm Amy Goodman. This is Democracy Now! Thanks so much for joining us.